God, I thank you for the way in which you, you go before us and you do incredible things and you, you use all of these little things to just bring life and light into the life of so many people. God, we thank you for life today. And we thank you for the ways that our lives are intricately connected, how you're always writing a story among us. So for those of us who decided to journey together today, together, Lord, we pray that you would bring us all on one accord, that we might worship you with, as one body and glorify you, God, because you're worthy. Meet us in this place. In your son's name, amen. Let's stand together, everybody. Let's clap our hands. This is just a song about who Jesus is, that he's the Holy One. We sing it out. Sing Yahweh, another name for him. Yahweh, holy is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. Let's sing that together. Sing Yahweh, Yahweh, holy is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. Now everybody clap right here. Hey, hey, hey. Oh. Let's sing it again. Let's call on his name. Yahweh. 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 I don't want to take it in vain. Sing Yahweh, Yahweh, Yahweh. Holy is your name. Holy is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. This part says, there will be no other God before you. Come on, see that. There will be no other God before you. This next part says, there is no one above you, no one beside you, nobody like you. There will be no other God before you. And like a choir we sing, no one, no one, no one. Let's sing it one more time. Sing Yahweh, Yahweh, yes. Yahweh, holy is your name. Holy is your name. I don't want to take it in vain. Sing that there will be no other God. There will be no other God before you. There is no God above you. There is no God above you. No one beside you. Nobody like you. There will be no other God before you. Sing no one. No one. No one. No one. Hey, 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 hey. Sing no one. Let's talk about him. Sing, who else can lead us, lead us to freedom? You sing, no one, no one, no one. And who else can heal all our sins and diseases? You sing, no one, no one, no one. And who else can walk, walk on the water? No one, no one, no one. And who else can answer, answer by fire? No one. No one, no one. And who else can bring down the tallest of giants? No one, Come on, church, no testify. One, no one. And who else can silence the roar of the lion? No one, hey. no one, no one. And who else is worthy, worthy of worship? No one, no Come one. Come on, 
church testify. Sing, who else is worthy, worthy of worship? No one, no one. No one, one no way. No one, no way. Did you guys catch that part? I want us to sing it together like a big anthem all together. We're gonna to sing no one nowhere, no one nowhere. Let's sing it right here. No one nowhere, no one nowhere, no one nowhere. Testify, no one nowhere, no one nowhere. Nobody like you, Jesus. Nobody like you. Hey. Nobody. Get us a love song to him saying, Lover of my soul, lover of my soul, lover of my soul, lover of my soul. Nobody like you, nobody like you, nobody like you, love. no one, no way, no one, no way, lover of my soul. Nobody do us like Jesus. No one nowhere. No one nowhere. Oh, we worship you, Jesus. And I searched and I found nobody like Jesus. I've looked all around, but there's nobody like Jesus. So let's just testify together, church. Hey, 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 hey. I searched and I found nobody like Jesus. 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 I searched and I found nobody like Jesus. I searched and I found nobody like Jesus. Nobody like him. Nobody like him. Nobody like him. I grew up in a Baptist church, and when I grew up, they used to sing it like this. They used to sing it like this. They used to say, "Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't 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 nobody do me like Jesus." Can't nobody do me like Jesus. Can't nobody do me They'll like sing, Jesus. They'll sing, nobody, nobody. 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 There will be no other God before you. There will be no other God before you. Come on, lift your hands and sing that there is no one. There is no God above you, no God beside you. No one like you. There will be no other God before you. Sing, there will be no other God before you. Come on, sing that, church. Sing it to him. There will be no other God before you. No one nowhere. No one nowhere. No one nowhere. Come on, all over this room. If you feel comfortable, let's just lift up our hands to him. There's nobody like Jesus. Nobody like Jesus. Hey, 
Nobody like Jesus. Oh, we worship you, worship you, worship you. Nobody like Jesus. You're worthy, Lord. You're worthy, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Let's just give him a moment of worship all over this room. No one like you, Jesus. No one like you, Lord. We search the whole world and there's nobody like you. We search high, we search low. You're the only God. You are our firm foundation. You are everything that we need, Lord. So we put our trust in you. We put our hope in you. Everything else falls apart. Everything else is sinking sand. Hallelujah. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus. Cause he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. And why would he fail now? He won't. This is one of those songs that just encourages your faith. We rest on him. He won't fail. Let's declare this all over the room. Hallelujah. I still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. And I won't be going under. I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail now? Come on, declare this He won't He won't, he won't fail, he won't fail, he won't fail, he won't, he won't, he won't fail, he won't fail. Christ is my firm foundation. Come on, sing it out, church. The rock. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken. I've never been more glad. I've never been more glad. Oh, that I put my faith in Jesus. Because he's never let me down. So why would he fail now? Someone testify. He won't. Yeah. He won't. This is how I know. He won't fail. I tried him and I found he out. declare that all over this room. We exercise your faith. He won't. We motivate your faith today that he'll never fail. He won't fail. He won't fail. Oh. I have a testimony to sing. This is my story, this is my song. I sing it because I know it for myself. Then rain came and wind blew the 
my house was built on you and I'm safe with you I'm gonna make it through come on sing that church rain came when my house was built on you I'm standing strong. I'm on standing you. strong on yeah. you. Sing, I'm gonna make it. Yes, I'm gonna make it through. Cause my house was Cause built my on house you. is built on you. Christ is my firm foundation. The rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking. Come on, sing it high. Because I put my faith in Jesus. Yeah. Because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. We declare. He won't fail. He won't fail. I wish I had some people that think he about it fail. to look back over their life and see that he has never failed. He won't. He won't. He won't fail. So there's a nursery rhyme. Yes, I'm going to preach a nursery rhyme. That talked about the three little pigs, right? One of them built their house with straw. One of them built their house with sticks. And one of them built their house with bricks. Rain came and wind blew, but my house was built on you. Come on, can somebody sing that this morning? I'm saved. With you, oh, I'm gonna make it. When the storms of life, the big bad storms came, came oh, and wind blew, my house was built on you. Sing, I'm saved, I'm safe Ooh. with you. I'm standing strong. I'm gonna make it. Through. Sing, I'm gonna make it through. I'm gonna make it through. Cause I'm standing strong. Cause I'm standing strong on you. I'm gonna make now it. I'm gonna make it through. Cause my house was built. My on house you. is built on you. I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna make hey, it through. Cause I'm standing strong. Cause I'm on standing you. strong on you. I'm gonna make it. I'm, I'm gonna, gonna make it. Make it, it yeah. It my house was built on My you. house is built on you. Oh, when the storms of life are raging, we're standing strong on you. We're standing strong on you. When the storms of life are raging, I'm standing strong on you. I'm standing strong on you. When the flood of life is coming, he lift up a standard, and we're standing strong on you. We're standing strong on you. When the floods of life are coming, we're standing strong on you. Oh, come on, all over this room, let's just lift up our hands right now. And thank God that we have an anchor that we've built our lives on something strong.
The psalmist said, all other land, ground is sinking sand. So our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ and his righteousness. Nothing else will do. You are our firm foundation, Lord. We rest in you. No matter what this world brings, whether we see death, famine, heartbreak, Lord, we put our trust in you. The future is in your hands. And God, we know even when there are things that we feel like are hard to experience or go through, that you are faithful to hold our hands through those situations, to be with us. So still we stand, still we stand on you through every high and every low. We still put our trust in you. We still put our faith in you. You're worthy of all of our worship. You're worthy of all of our praise. We love you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We love you, Lord. Come on, church, one more time. Let's put our hands together and worship the Lord together. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to pray for our kids as we get ready to dismiss them into the kids' ministry. If there's a little one near you, go ahead and extend your hand towards them. And we want to pray over them right now. God, we pray for our little ones. We pray that this truth that we've just sung about, that can't nobody do us like Jesus that there's no one nowhere and that this is the solid rock that we build our faith upon. Lord, we pray that they will someday come to know that for themselves and trust you in that way. Help us to plant the seeds. Help us to water the seeds. And never let us be a distraction to stand in the way of them knowing you. But instead, let us point the way so that when they are older, they will never depart from it. God, thank you for entrusting their little lives in our hands. But we know ultimately, Lord, it's you who are writing their story. So bless them. Bless our teachers today, Pastor Katie, our staff, Lucas. I pray, Lord, that you help them to guide them in the way of truth. And let there be a moment for even them where they see you for themselves as the teachers and the leaders minister in a great way downstairs. And while we continue our worship up here, be with us, oh God. Help us to hear your word and shape us by it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, kids. Bye, y'all. Have a good time. And, and right, kids. So <laughs> small groups, now that we finally have it all figured out, small groups are going to kick off on October 10th. Everybody say October 10th. So we got a couple weeks before we hit small groups. Um, but listen to this. We've been doing this whole series. We're kicking off a series today called Jesus Revealed. This series is all about, uh, series is all about us helping to see where Jesus is in the Old Testament narrative and the New Testament promise, how he fulfills those prophecies from the Old Testament. And we are actually following along with all of that with our um, with the Jewish high holy, um, high holy Days, thank you, it's a little tongue twister there, the Jewish High Holy Days of Rosh Hashanah and, and all of the rest of them that follow, Yom Kippur, and um, it's our opportunity to see as Christians the rich history that's a part of the Jewish community. But for us as Christians, we also get to see, connected to that, how the promise of Jesus fulfills that. We as Christians believe Jesus is the Messiah, and so he fulfills um, those things things that um, were uh, promised and prophesied in the Old Testament. 
So while we're doing that, we're going to be going through a small group series on Thursday nights at 6 o'clock. Um, 6 o'clock starts with dinner, and then about 7, we'll do our lesson. But here's what's super cool. I have a new rabbi friend who's going to come, and on October 10th, when we kick this off, we are kicking it off with a Shabbat dinner. Isn't that kind of cool? Did that feel holy? I think she felt the spirit over there a little bit. The Shabbat dinner, which is just a, a moment of pause and reflection on the week um, that you've had and the promise of who God is and what he would do in the week to come. And so Rabbi Gordon is going to be with us for that night. It's really great. It was kind of a, a real cool story. I was um, thinking, like, I would love for us to be led in a Shabbat dinner by a rabbi, but every rabbi I know has a synagogue that they're leading, and October in High Holy Days, means that they have no life outside of church because they have so many services that they are doing. And so I knew I was not going to be able to get one of my friends who are rabbi to come and do this. But I was at a, um, a meeting with all of the clergy, uh, some of the clergy in Newton. This is the Newton Interfaith uh, Leadership um, Association. And um, I met a new rabbi who was sitting at my table who was retired. I said, oh, interesting. You're retired. That means your life is not about to be crazy come October. Um, and then he also shared a little bit about how he does interfaith work um, at the Hebrew College, which was like, cool, because what I want to do is an interfaith situation here. We want to have a, a Jewish rabbi lead us in a Shabbat dinner, but for a group of Christians. Um, and so I introduced myself to him, and I exchanged cards with him, and we've been emailing. And he's more than ecstatic, more than happy to join us to do this and lead this Shabbat dinner. So it's going to be a really cool time. So on October 10th, everybody say October 10th. All right, so you don't have to text and say, do we have small groups? Nope, not until October 10th. October 10th, we kicks it off with a Shabbat dinner. And then following that, we're going to be doing um, a series called um, The Chosen, watching the, uh, an episode from The Chosen and then doing some discuss uh, discussion questions. So we're going to be in season four of The Chosen. The Chosen season four um, is out. If you haven't watched seasons one, two, and three, that's okay. If you read the Bible and went to any kind of Sunday school, you probably know a lot about what happens in one, seasons one, two, and three as they talk about the birth, um, the Jesus coming and walking the earth and some miracles and things he's done. It's now in the fourth season, and we're going to be studying in the fourth season. All right, so we'll watch the episode. And then we will talk about it, which is kind of cool. So it's like movie night every every Wednesday, which is going to be really exciting. Uh, I'm sorry, Thursday. Thank you. Thank you. Keeping me on my toes. Thursday is at 6 o'clock. 6 to about 8.30 is what time we'll be here uh, together. So on October 10th is when that starts. Um, and we'll, that'll take us all the way through East, or Christmas. Uh, we'll be looking at this all the way until Christmas time um, in our small groups, even though we'll be doing a few other series along the way. Um, like always, in November, we're going to be celebrating Thanksgiving together with a big meal, um, hopefully in joint with Parish of St. Paul and uh, some of our neighbors in the community who want to join us for a, very, for a free meal. We always do this in connection with the indigenous community here in Newton, another interfaith experience where we have, uh, we say we're going to be better pilgrims. That's how we see it. We're going to do a better job than uh, the ones that came before us, um, and, but we're going to sit down with a meal in the commemoration of what that was supposed to be back, like for those two uh, uh, entities to come together. And we always have Chef Sherry here, so I hope she's going to come back with us this year. We haven't talked to, her, talked to her yet, but she did say last year, and I got it on video, she said, I'm going to come back every single year. I love this event. And so we're going to get her. Chef Sherry is big time now, man. I tell you, she's won like the Oscar of awards for uh, for uh, being a chef. Um, and so it's so cool that we get someone of such high caliber and prestige to join us here for that meal. So more information coming about that. And then we're into all the holiday things, Christmas and New Year. It's going to be so much fun. But right now, we're kicking off this new series called Jesus Revealed. And I'm really excited about it. I'm trying to put a lot of things in this series. This series is going to be commemorating a lot for us as a church as we talk about who Jesus is in the narrative and in the story. I'm going to try to give us some application around um, this election season since we're entering October. November 5th is coming soon. I don't know about you, but there might be a lot of distress in your heart about this season and what's going on. We want you to be good citizens of this world, of this country. So if you are a citizen, we want you to vote. We want you to be active. We're not going to tell you who to vote for, but we're going to tell you where your heart posture ought to be as you're thinking about it um, 
um, and as you're going through it, especially during the time of such division. So I'm going to try to touch on that a little bit in this series while also acknowledging all of the wonderful things about the Jewish heritage. All right, so a lot going on in this, but we're going to be talking about that in a moment. Let's take a quick break, everybody. Um, you can go grab some coffee, run to the restroom, grab a snack or something, or a treat from the back, um, and we'll be back here in about five minutes to kick off our series, Jesus Revealed. Okay, let's do that. All right, everybody. Welcome back. Good morning. Come on back to your seats and join us for um, this opportunity for us to transition back into our sermon. We're kicking off a new series um, this morning called Jesus Revealed. And um, we had such a cool story happen this morning. Um, if you guys haven't had the opportunity to, to um, meet um, Angela is her name. Um, a year ago, you guys, we, um, a couple in our church was out for a walk. They were um, walking like normal, taking a, a scroll. And, and this, this couple, Meg and Brian, are, uh, have a, a deep heart for the unhoused. And they knew that there was some a tent kind of spaces um, in the forest space. And so they always made it their business to just kind of walk around and check. So they went through a certain area and they walked around and they stumbled upon a tent in the, um, the body of Menor, Minor. Um, and, um, and, they, and they realized that he had passed away. And they called the police and all of that. It was on the news, all this stuff happened. Um, our hearts in our church, we, our hearts were broken um, to, at this and we, we tried our best to locate family and, and friends. We put things out on Facebook and all of that, but we were limited. Uh, we didn't know much about this individual. We knew his name because I think it was written inside of something um, that he had. And uh, so we did our best to try to put the information out there. Um, and if you guys remember a year ago, we actually decided as a church community to host a memorial for him. We were out in the park where he, where he, he was found we created um, a, a beautiful little cross and we walked it and put it in the space of where he was found and put some flowers and stuff there. Well, listen to this miracle. Today, walking in our church is Angela, who is the girlfriend of Menor, who, um, who found our church because of the memorial of what we did for him online. Isn't that cool? So living 45 minutes or so away, she... She dated him off and on, and, and um, what a blessing it is to meet you. And they have a 13-year-old daughter together. And uh, his body was sent to Guatemala. So the cross that we planted is the only thing you guys have is memory of him. That is, church, can we just thank God for his providence and how incredible, how God works that's little miracles right there. You want to see Jesus revealed in our world? That's the little stuff like that that happens that makes a big impact on the lives of folks. Angela, we're so grateful that you're here. We're okay. We would love to meet your daughter. We would, we would love to meet her. Wow. Wow. Oh, wow. Well, you're absolutely welcome. It was our privilege. And we're so grateful you're sorry for your loss. We never got a chance to say that to you before, but it's a delight to meet you. And thank you so much for worshiping with us today. Awesome. Let's welcome her one more time, everybody. Wow. Moving stuff. Bre uh, my, uh, uh, Meg and Brian aren't here today, but I sent them a text message. I was like, you would never believe what just happened. Angela's here. This is who she is. And they, they send back a response, um, and they just shared how deeply moving it was um, for, um, for this to, to have happened. They wish they were here, and they were so incredibly moved by this uh, story. Um, and they're watching on Facebook Live um, as best as they can. So, so we wave to, to Meg and Brian. Uh, thank you guys for your big heart and the way you love people. Um, I love Meg and Brian. They are incredible incredible individuals. I know we all love them so much, you know. Since they're watching, just go ahead and say how we love y'all. See you guys. We'll see you next week. Um, they're traveling there. I think they're in the car right now, so they're listening. Um, maybe one person's watching, but they're, they're listening to the live stream. 
Wow, what a wonderful, wonderful story. Um, we kick off a new series today called Jesus Revealed. So over the next few weeks, church, we're going to be diving into the heart of who Jesus is as it pertains to and, and is related to the Old Testament prophecies about him in connection to um, uh, many of the Jewish high holy days. So we're going to see Jesus and reveal him as the Messiah. We'll reveal him as the Savior. We'll reveal him as the healer, and we'll reveal him as Lord. So for the next four or five weeks, we'll be talking um, about this, and, um, and we'll see how every single one of the Jewish high holy days, according to us as Christians, point to Jesus. Uh, the one who brings new life, who brings forgiveness, and who brings hope. So starting today with the High Holy Day of Rosh Hashanah, which today is not, but we are focusing on, on that today, we'll see Jesus as the king who brings a fresh start, a new beginning. Rosh Hashanah is the High Holy Day that is a new year, representing kind of a new year uh, for the Jewish community. And it's an opportunity for them to look back and to look forward and see this new beginning. It's like pressing um, a reset button um, on, on life. It's a chance to repent, to ask forgiveness, to start afresh, to start anew. And for us, we understand that Jesus is the one who gives us that new beginning. Amen. So um, um, he is still doing that work in people's lives today, no matter where you are, no matter who you are, he gives new beginnings. He gives us a fresh start. So as we dive into this, we're going to be looking at uh, John chapter one, verses one through 14, where the word, as John describes it, becomes flesh. But before we get there, um, I just wanted to uh, make sure that we understood just a little bit of facts about Rosh Hashanah. It is the new year. It's the start of a new beginning. It's a time where the Jewish brothers and sisters celebrate the creation of the world and the coronation of God as king. That God kicks this whole thing off and it's no ordinary holiday. Um, it's a celebration of where they, they typically blow the shofar, which is this circular kind of shaped uh, horn. Um, I don't have one, so I'm not blowing one for you today, but they typically blow the shofar. It's almost like this calling to wake up, you know, to repent and start afresh. If you have gone dormant in yourself and your faith, this is your opportunity Burn, to wake up. The alarm sounds. It's time to get back, get back at it. Now, while it looks back, it also looks forward as to what God is going to be doing. So it's a time of reflecting on the past year. It's a chance to repent of your sins, to believe that the power of God's mercy uh, can give you a brand new start. It's like hitting the reset button, like I said before, and it's the opportunity for us to see Jesus as Christians and where he is ultimately the king and where he is the one who gives this new beginning. And he's not just giving us a new beginning. He is the Lord of our whole year. He's even the God of our eternity. Amen. Amen. So in John chapter one, verses one through 14, the word becomes flesh. It lives among us. Jesus, the king of kings, didn't just stay in heaven. He came down to give us a new beginning a fresh start and a chance to be born again. He's not just any king. He's the king who brings light into the darkness. He's the king who brings and makes all things new. And so today when we reflect on Jesus as the Messiah and the king, we're reminded that in him every day is a chance to start again. You don't have to wait. As Christians, we don't have to wait to the new year. We don't have to wait to Rosh Hashanah for us Jesus gives us a brand new start every day. Scripture says it like this, that his mercies are new every morning. Amen? Amen. So we walk in this newness of life. So let's read together John chapter 1, verse 1 through 14. It says this. It's up on the screen so you can read along. It says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that had been made. And in him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to, the, to uh, testify concerning the light, so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light. 
He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your word, both the words we read today and the word that is represented in Jesus. We thank you for the revelation of, of this word to help us see who he is and the self-revelation of God through the spirit of the Holy Spirit to show us and in our hearts who you are on a regular basis. We lean on that fact today that you reveal who you are to us through the word. And today, as we expose, as we capture, as we reveal, as we uncover who you are as the Messiah and the beginning and the end, God, make it so real to us that we live our lives in such a way that it's been affected by this truth. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. All right. Four points for us this morning. Here's your first one. Jesus was there in the beginning. Verses one through five says, in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. He was with God in the beginning. And though through him, all things were made without him. Nothing was made that had been made. In him was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. That light shined in darkness and the darkness did not overcome it. These verses um, represent uh, us drawing back to the moment of creation. It's a mirror in its language of Genesis chapter one, verse one, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. John is not just starting the gospel with a historic reference, but with a profound theological truth. He's talking, he's taking us back to the place beyond time itself to this timeless eternity where Jesus, the word, existed with God. There is no clearer moment in scripture where it is pointed out to us that the Old Testament is not a place where Jesus did not exist, but instead Jesus was with God in the beginning. It actually gives definition to and purpose to why God was described in the Old Testament in the creation narratives as Elohim, which is a plural verb for God. It says the gods was there at the beginning, the gods. But the idea of it, it is not that there's just a plural God, but there's one God doing it all, but somehow this God is made of, of, of parts. And it gives us a review of the Trinity, of Jesus as the Son, God as the Father, and the Holy Spirit also as God. Three in one, all in one purpose. We talked about that um, a couple of weeks back. And so we get a glimpse of that, and it's clearly stated by John in this um, in this description, John helps us understand this is what was meant by Elohim, that God was there creating, but so was the son. He was there at the very beginning. He uses this Greek word for word called logos. Logos signifies more than just a spoken word, but logos represents a divine personality, the very force and the ex expression of God that brought everything into being is who we are talking about in this text. It is the, the creative power that shaped the stars and the mountain and the oceans and everything that we see. Jesus wasn't simply present at the beginning, but he was the creative force behind all of creation. John's gospel makes it clear that Jesus wasn't just a man who appeared in history, but he was and is the eternal God who existed before all things. 
John emphasizes this by saying, through him, all things were made. Without him, nothing was made that has been made. In other words, Jesus is not only the creator, but in him, without him, nothing absolutely nothing exists. Not only was things created by him, but things are sustained by him. The passage reveals the pre-existence, the distinctiveness, uh, the deity of Christ, that not only is Christ the one who walked this earth, but he gives us a very clear picture that Christ himself is God. He was with God. He was always with God. He was creating with God and he's sustaining everything with God. He was fully divine, equal with God, and participated in the acts of creation itself. By making this bold statement, John is is speaking both to the Jews and to the Gentile audience. For the Jews, he he is tying Jesus to the word of God that they understood as God's active presence in the world. For the Gentile, especially the Greeks, um, he who saw the Logos as the rational principle for governing the universe, John declares that these principles are not impersonal. These ideas that the Greeks had are now personified in Jesus himself. So the word or the logos was involved in every detail of the universe and has ultimate authority over all things. For both groups, they're standing there listening to John's words going, wait a minute. Everything I have lived about for this to this point, everything I believed in up until this point, everything that was taught to me up until this point has been pointing to Jesus. To help us grasp this, think about an artist in their masterpiece before the artist ever puts paint to the canvas. The vision of this complex, com- completed work and complex work had already been alive in their minds. It existed in their hearts before the world ever saw it. The masterpiece has its origins in the artist's creative thought long before the first brush stroke is applied. In this way, Jesus is like that audience, that artist, but on a cosmic scale. Before the world was ever made, he saw it. He knew it. He was there and he was speaking life into it. Now imagine that that masterpiece coming to life and deciding that it didn't need the artist anymore. It would be unthinkable to think that the very thing that created you, you have no need for. The very one who who brushed and formed you, you have no purpose for. We living in a world today, church, where people are, are, are rationalizing God out of everything. That is easier to believe in good vibes than it is to believe in a good God. That is easier to believe in, in energy than it is to believe in the, in the eternal God. It, it, it's, it's, it's this idea that we are depending upon ourselves and the things we can see only. But do we not know that we are only a piece of a masterpiece? We were created. We were formed. We were made. And because of that, we ought to give allegiance to. Uh, we ought to give applause to. We ought to give our lives to the very one who created us. We we are not the piece, the masterpiece. The master is the masterpiece. And he has brought each of us into existence. And we are to reflect him and who he is. Amen? Amen. What does this mean for us? It means that Jesus has been part of our story from the very start. From the very, from the very moment that you were conceived or even thought of. Even before that, he knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. He was there from the very, very beginning. He knows our beginning and our end because he is the beginning and he is the end. When life feels overwhelming or feels lost, we can take comfort in knowing that Jesus is not only present at creation, but he continues to sustain us in his power. Verses four and five tells us that in him was life and that life was the light of all mankind and that light shines in the darkness and the darkness has not overcome it. No matter how dark life gets, church, life is, Jesus is the light that can never be um, extinguished. We can call on him, the life 
in the light. We can trust in him who knows our purpose, who, who gives us life. Jesus was there in the beginning. He is still with us. He is guiding us. He is holding our futures in his hands. And because he is the beginning and the end, because he is there at creation and sustains the created, we know that he works all things together for our good. So if it ain't good yet, right, then God ain't done working yet, right? Because this is what he does. He's the author and the finisher of our faith. He is Alpha and he is the Omega. He's the first and he is the last. Jesus was there in the beginning and he knows our end before our beginning. Jesus was there in the beginning. Here's your second point. Jesus is prophecy fulfilled. Verses 6 to 8 says this, that there was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning um, that light so that through him all might believe. He himself was not the light, but he came only as a witness to that light. These verses help takes a shift in the narrative. It goes from the eternal nature of the word to the human agent who will prepare the way for the word namely John the Baptist. The message introduces John not as the main event, but as the one who, who sent uh, to point, the one who was sent to point people towards the main event, who was Jesus. He was the fulfillment of the prophecy. As a matter of fact, the prophet Isaiah even talked about Isaiah, I mean, uh, talked about John the Baptist coming to prepare the way. And so John himself was the reality of, of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the, the uh, fulfillment of the passage of Old Testament. But then he was also speaking to the one who will be also a fulfillment of the passage of the Old Testament. This shows us that Jesus wasn't just this figure who appeared out of nowhere. He has come, his coming was anticipated. His coming was foretold. His coming was carefully prepared for by God through his prophets. Everybody had been speaking and pointing to this Jesus. So John the Baptist arrives on the scene and he was a part of the divine plan to make sure that the world was ready to receive this long awaited Messiah. His role was not to take the spotlight, but it was to point everyone to this true light who was Jesus. John's testimony was crucial because it validated Jesus as the fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. If Jesus was going to be the Messiah, there had to be someone who came before him who was supposed to prepare the way because that's what the prophet said. So the fact that John came was testimony that Jesus was on the way, right? I love when you get like anticipating kind of news. Have you ever got a news that, that was just like, it's kind of like you waiting on your check every month, right? Or every, every couple of weeks. It's just like, you know, every time you punch out, you just realize my check is coming. My check is coming. Uh, Katie and I are big fans of uh, the talk show, The View. We watch it all the time. Um, Katie's a big fan. She just wrote me into it. And uh, Whoopi's become one of my favorite folks on the show. And Whoopi, uh, somebody asked Whoopi, what's your favorite part about being on this show? She goes, the paycheck. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I love how real it is, right? But that's how we, you know you work in your job. I know you got purpose. You love your work. You love what you do. But it's the paycheck that you really, really are looking forward to. It's like every couple of weeks when they hit your bank account, you like, hey, it's exciting. And you, so you go refresh every time to see if you just got paid. You know that that's your favorite part about working at your job is getting paid. Because if you didn't get paid, I don't know that you would do it. Be honest. You would not put up with everything you put up with. And so think of it like that as you're anticipating something that is promised to happen. Something that you are expecting to happen. And when it happens, that joy that you get down on the inside. John was the precursor to said joy. John was the one who came. And when John came, it told everybody around him, get ready, get ready, get ready, get ready. Because the Messiah is on the way. And so when the Messiah showed up, John pointed everybody to him and he baptized him. He's saying, y'all, this is the one who's been waiting, but it was John's job to prepare the way in the wilderness. John's testimony was crucial because it validated that Jesus 
was on the way. The people of Israel had been waiting for the Messiah, the one who, they, who was called, who was going to come to save them. And it was John's role to announce that he had indeed come. Now, let me talk for a moment here. Um, because he came as a witness, verse 7 says, to testify concerning that light so that, the, the, so that through him all might believe. John's authority came from God and his mission was singular. It was to prepare the way for Jesus. I want to break this down for us a little bit. Have you ever been to a concert or a big event and there's like an opening act? Yeah. You know, the opening act, they, they're not exactly who you came for, but they are part of, of it. So the crowd is kind of getting excited, you know. Most of the time, they're not paying fully attention yet. Folks are still walking in. Folks are still kind of getting situated. But the main event is on the way, and you're getting excited. You're just waiting for the lights to dim out, you know, so everybody start going, Wah! they're coming. Your favorite person is about to hit the stage, right? It's like that. John the Baptist wasn't the main event, but he was the opening act. Everybody knew the concert was about to start. The miracle was about to start. The, mir- the, 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 the testimony was about to come forth. Jesus was on the way because the opening act had hit the stage. You're closer to the main event when the opening act starts, right? And if the opening act hasn't started yet, you know you got time still to go to the bathroom, go get you some popcorn, go do any of those kind of things. If your friend that you're supposed to meet you earlier is running late and they still try to park, you know how it is in Boston. It's hard out there for those who are trying to park in the city. And so they still try to park. So you like, you still got time. You still got time. They say, but then when the lights start to show the, the opening act, it's like, you got to hurry up. It's about to start. You got to hurry up. That's the moment of what's happening in this story for the people. It's the opening act and it's pointing to Jesus. John the Baptist is saying, I'm not the main event. You didn't come here to see me, but get ready because they're backstage and the show is about (laughs) to begin. John, just like John, we are called to point people to Jesus. We, like John, are called to be an opening act. To Jesus. Our lives should reflect the light of Jesus Christ. It it should reflect uh, the way in which he loves others and how he takes notice. We are not the light, but we have the privilege of carrying the light into the world that desperately needs it. The songwriter said it like this, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine, let it shine, let it shine. Just as John testified to the coming of Jesus, we too are called to testify to his presence. And everywhere we go, I pray that the evidence of who we are will simply tell people that Jesus is near. Right? We are not the main show. But when we show up, people should feel like Jesus is near. When we are comforting folks who are hurting, they should feel like Jesus is near. When we are praying for people, they should feel like Jesus is near. When you are just working at work, folks should just know over in the other cubicle is proof that Jesus is near. Let our lives shine in that way. Jesus is prophecy fulfilled. Jesus was there in the beginning. And your third point is Jesus is a new beginning. Somebody say new beginning. beginning. In verses 9 to 13, the focus shifts again. First it was talking about the word. Then it shifts to this prophecy fulfilled. Now it's shifting to this concept of the true light who brings a new beginning to humanity. The passage tells us that Jesus is the genuine light of the world, the one who would illustrate the truth and offer new life to anyone and everyone who will receive him. The world, as the scripture says, did not recognize him, even though he was, even though he was the creator, even though he was the one who, who, who created them. He was the, the, the artist behind them being created. The world still did not know who he was. Jesus came in this very world he made, yet many turned away, many rejected him, and instead of receiving the gift he brought, many turned away from him. But for those who did recognize him, for those who believed and accepted him, he gave them the right to become children of God. 
The new beginning is not something we were born into naturally, but something we recognize through faith. We, we are welcomed by Jesus into a new beginning. Jesus paints a picture of two contrasting responses to Jesus. John paints this picture. He said, there are those who will reject him and those, those who will receive him. So Jesus may, or John makes a, a, a contrasting point from rejection and reception. Though he came to his own, meaning his people and his creation, many did not recognize him. They didn't see the Savior right in front of them. But in verse 12, John shifts to highlight the beauty of what happens when people do accept him. He says, yet to all who did receive them, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's the new beginning John is talking about. It's a fresh start that changes everything. It doesn't come from natural birth. It doesn't come from human effort or anything we can do on our own. It is spiritual transformation. It's a rebirth. It only comes from God. I wish I could just take a moment to acknowledge that many of us are here today because Jesus came into our lives and transformed our lives. You are sitting next to someone who's been born again, <laughs> someone who knows what it means uh, for Jesus to change everything. None of us are perfect, church, but every one of us in this room ought to be grateful for that day when Jesus came into our lives and changed our lives. Like the saying goes, I'm not what I ought to be, but thank God I'm not what I used to be. I am made new. I've been born again. I've been washed by the blood. The places I used to go, I don't go anymore. The things I used to do, I don't do anymore. I've been changed. I've been bought with the price. I have been redeemed. I'm grateful that Jesus saved my wretched soul. And is anybody else in this room grateful, willing to open up their mouth and just say, thank you, Lord, that he picked you up and turned you around and placed your feet on a solid ground. I am free today because whom the sun set free is free indeed. Thank God for new beginnings. Thank God for another chance. Thank God for rebirth. Jesus offers us a new beginning every day, no matter where we come from, no matter our past. He invites us to be a part of God's family. This new life isn't something we can earn. It is a gift that comes through believing in him. And if we receive him, if we trust in him, we, he promises to give us the right to become children of God. We are adopted into his family. That means our identity changes. That means our purpose changes. That means our future changes. Jesus is the start of something new in our lives and it's up to us to accept the invitation of a new beginning. Jesus is a new beginning. Jesus is the promise, is the prophecy fulfilled and Jesus is, was there in the beginning. And here is point number four. Jesus is the son of God. Look at verse 14. It says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. He has seen, uh, we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only son who came from the father, full of grace and truth. You see, verse 14 introduces us to a profound truth about Jesus. It tells us he is the son of God. This verse tells us that the word, the Logos, was who was with God in the beginning, became flesh and dwell among us. He is Emmanuel, as we celebrate around Christmas time. This is a clear statement about the incarnation, God becoming man. It's not just that Jesus was always uh, divine, but he took on human flesh entering into the world in a way that was new and different from the eternal existence. He pitched his tent among us. <laughs> living with the same limitations, living with the same struggles that we face, but without sin. 
And in doing so, Jesus revealed the glory of God here on earth, a glory full of grace, a glory full of truth that the disciples witnessed with their own eyes. The Son of God became one of us, showing us not only who God is, but also how much this God loves us, that he will send his only begotten Son, that while we were still sinners, that he would die for us. The beauty of this verse is that it contrasts this eternal nature of Jesus with this temporary earthly mission. While verse 1 tells us that the word was God, verse 14 tells us that the word became flesh. This change is significant because it speaks to the depth of God's love and his desire to connect with humanity. Jesus, the son of God, did not just remain distant in heaven. He entered into human history, taking on um, our nature. John emphasized it by saying, we have seen his glory, implying that we didn't hide his divinity, but instead he revealed the, who he was through his life, death, and resurrection resurrection. He is the unique son of God, the only one who could fully show us who the father is. And this, my friends, is the gospel. It's what the church is called to preach. Jesus is life. Jesus is death. And Jesus is resurrection. We proclaim that holy night when the stars were brightly shining, that the night, it was the night that Jesus was born. We sing that Jesus went to Calvary to save a wretch like you and me, and we call that love. We declare that he rose from the grave with all power in his hand, and we believe that he is living and next to the Father now. We tell the world that he lived he died and he rose again. Why? Because this is the truth that changes everything. God came to earth, Emmanuel, God with us. And because of Calvary, you and I are saved. And if there is anybody here in this room today or anybody watching on live or watching this later in the week, I, and then you haven't embraced this truth, let me tell you, it is the best decision that you can ever make. It's a new beginning. It's a fresh start. It's the very power and purpose of Rosh Hashanah. Jesus is not a distant God who can't relate to our problems. He is the son of God who became flesh and who knows what it's like to be human and who knows our pain and our struggles firsthand. And because he lived among us, we can trust him to guide us through the difficulties of life. We can see in Jesus the, fulfill, the fullness of God's grace and truth. His incarnation means that God is with us. And the fact that he walked this earth and left his Holy Spirit means that God is always and still is with us. We can see Jesus in everything in all parts of our lives. And so our only response is not to just uh, live in this same grace and truth by ourselves, but we would tell the world that there's a grace and truth that, that has brought people over 2,000 years to this place, and that same grace and truth will carry us 2,000 more. We can receive this gift, and we can live in this light because the Son of God came down to us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, God for sending your only son to die for us. Thank you, Jesus, for willingly giving up your throne and coming down to this earth. Oh, can we just thank him for a moment, church? Thank you, God, for seeing us in our wretchedness and still deciding to love us. Thank you that every time we fall, you don't change your mind about us. You still choose to love us and you give us the opportunity to come to you and ask for forgiveness and be made right with you through the son of God. I thank you, Lord, that I don't have to be perfect because you are perfect. I don't have to cross every T and dot every I because you have already done that. Thank you that you are the God who loves us so much that you have made it possible for us to be in right relationship with you. Thank you, Lord. Can somebody just say, thank you, Lord. Thank you for seeing me and loving me. That's who we serve. That's who we worship. 
on us every Sunday morning and every day of our lives. So as we come to the close of our message this morning, and as we reflect on the season that we're entering into, there's a lot going on in our world. And I want us to lean on this Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year, as a good time to pause and reflect, to press the reset button, to be renewed, to repent of what was yesterday and of old, and instead start this new path forward. It's a season of new beginnings, church. And I'm declaring it's a season of new beginning for us as a church and for you as God's people, that this is a season of new beginnings. And just like we are reminded during Rosh Hashanah that God is the creator of all things, I hope this sermon helped us point to Jesus, the word who was there from the beginning and how he fulfilled all of those prophecies and that the son of God, he is the son of God and he is the one who brings light and darkness. This is the truth that is relevant today as it was when John first penned it. And in our current political climate, where division, fear, and uncertainty are rampant, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that Jesus is still sovereign. With elections around the corner, we are, we are hearing all kinds of voices. <laughs> promising change, offering solutions, or stoking divisions. It's all happening. But let me remind you, just like John the Baptist came to point the way to the true light, our role as believers is to point people back to Jesus. Now, don't get me wrong. I am not saying go to the polls on November 5th and write Jesus on the line. You got a choice to make. Don't cop out. <laughs> Make a choice. Make the best choice you feel like you can make. Jesus is not interested in being anybody's political president. He's not. So don't write his name. Amen? Amen. If he wanted to be a political leader, he would have come as a political leader. He did not. Right? He came in a different form. So we're not going to put him in that space. But instead, what I want to encourage us to do is I want us to be like John the Baptist. And I during this time where it can be difficult and hopeless and really confusing. Every time we turn on the news, there's something wacky being said. Right? This is a chance for us to point. <laughs> it gets wackier and wackier, doesn't it? This is a chance for us to point towards who Jesus really is. And there is no political party, in my opinion, that has a monopoly over that of who Jesus fully is. But we need to do our best to make a good decision. And in this time when everybody is stressed out and worried and confused, help point people to Jesus. Help them to build their hope on nothing less than Jesus Christ and righteousness. Amen. Amen. He is the one who is among us. You better believe Jesus gets it. He understands how wacky it is. He gets how, how, how important this, this time is. He gets what's happening, not only in this country, but in other countries around us. And he knows how all of them work together. And we're going to trust that God, who is still on the throne, who is still sovereign, to do what he's always done so well, shine light in the darkness and be, um, be a, a life where, there is, where it's needed most. There's no, no amount of political strife that can overcome him. Amen? Yeah. So our hope is in Jesus, the Son of God, the one who is full of grace and truth. And just like Rosh Hashanah invites us to enter into a season of self-examination and renewal, we too must reflect on how we can be agents of reconciliation, agents of truth, and agents of justice in our divided world. So Jesus came not to further divide, but he came to bring light and life. And you and I might be the closest Jesuses that anybody might see. So let us shine that light. Amen? Amen. Let's pray together. God, we thank you once again for your mercy, for your grace, for the ways that you love us unconditionally for the ways that you go before us and make our path straight, the ways that you make clear